So today we're on to chapter eight of the book. Anyone have any thoughts or reflections or ideas about chapter eight? What's that? An enjoyable chapter. Yeah, yeah, okay. Slubgob. Yeah, he talks about this law of undulation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, the, 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 all kinds of. We'll talk. We'll talk all about that here in just a minute. Any other uh, thoughts or comments or anything? Yeah. 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 So he, we'll we'll talk about th that too. This idea that humans are amphibians. When we think of amphibians, what we normally think of is frogs, right? Frogs are amphibians. Yeah. They can live just as well under the water as above, right? They, and in that sense, kind of have this dual nature about them. Now, he's not saying that human beings are amphibians in that sense. We don't live as well under the water as we do above, but uh, we do have a dual nature about us, and that's what and that's what he's talking about there. So we'll we'll um, we'll unpack that a little bit more here too. Well, let's let's just jump right into it then here. So it talks about this thing it calls. Uh, the law of undulation, and that's what Kathleen mentioned too. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about here. Um, we'll see what screw tape has to say about it first. So he says, this is right at the beginning of the chapter, he says to Wormwood, so you have great hopes that the patient's religious phase is dying away, have you? I've always thought that the training college had gone to pieces since they put all old slub gob in charge of it, and now I am sure. Has no one ever told you about the law of undulation? So Wormwood seems to have the idea that, you know, the, the patient number of chapters ago became a Christian and Wormwood seems to be optimistic that the patient is giving up this religious thing, right? Because his, his, his spiritual enthusiasm, let's say, is taking a dive, right? Where he was once very much eager and active about his Christian faith, it seems to be going downhill. And so Wormwood's got the idea that, oh, this is good news. He's given it up, right? And Screwtape says, basically, he says here, not, not so fast. You know, he's not actually giving it up. He, and what he's going to go on to say is human beings do this, right? They go through peaks and valleys, ups and downs. And here he's going to call it peaks and troughs, right? High points and low points with everything in life is what screw tape does. Not just religious stuff, but with everything in life. And so he, he, he comments that screw tape thinks that the training college where they train these demons to become temp, like it's all, this is all made up stuff, right? But the, the, the training college where they're training these demons to tempt people, he says it's all gone to, it's gone to rubbish, gone to pieces, that they put this guy slub glob in charge of it and he's not doing a good job teaching you guys about these ups and downs and things like that. So he carries on and he explains here to Wormwood, he says, humans are amphibians, half spirit and half animal. As spirits, they belong to the eternal world, but as animals, they inhabit time. This means that while their spirits can be directed towards an eternal object, their bodies, passions, and imaginations are in continual change their nearest approach to constancy or the, the most constant thing in their life, we could say it that way, therefore is undulation, the repeated return to a level from which they repeatedly fall back, a series of troughs and peaks or ups and downs, you know, peaks and valleys is probably how we would, we would normally say it ourselves. So screw tape says that this is what human beings do, that they go through undulation, peaks and valleys. And that's when I looked for a picture of undulation, that's the best picture I got, right? But that road is undulating. That's what it's doing, right? It's going up and down, 
right? Someone else at Redeemer pointed out yesterday, that's what snakes do too, right? Snakes move, the way that snakes move, they, you know, slithering back and forth is called undulation, right? Because they go from one side to the other and, they, and move forward as a result, okay? So th that's what undulation means, is these, these ups and downs. Well, and, and what, before we go any further, I guess the question is, to what extent is that a relatable thing? That human beings throughout life, you know, just in general, go through undulation, ups and downs. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, and we'll, we'll we'll get to that here in a second. That really Jesus is working in in the low points. But for now, I think it's important we realize that just looking at our own lives, this is the reality of things. You know, I, at least from my perspective, anyways. You know, this is how it goes. That you, I can look back at my life and see that there were, you know, times sometimes over the span of days or weeks that were particularly low times followed by a better time, or sometimes those low times extended over a year or two years, right? And we see those, the, the farther, the, the more perspective we gain as we get farther in life, I think the better we are able to look back and to see those things and to recognize those times in our lives. This is just the, this is just the, the truth of human existence as we go through undulation, peaks and valleys. And that's what screw tape is saying here. Leah? I was gonna say, I even see it beyond a like mental or spiritual health thing when it, it's not even a, a, an emotional up and down but just an up and down of our of our persona like yeah. for example like sometimes we go through phases where we're tired because we're super super busy and then in other phases we are super motivated and have lots of energy regardless of how busy we are and and that's not really a mental health thing necessarily that's just just a part of who we are that Sometimes when we're in these peaks, we can do more or we're more interested in things or whatever. And then in the valleys, it's not necessarily that we're depressed or feeling down, but we just are not interested in that thing anymore. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and screw tape kind of says that if you look at the bottom of page 37 here in the book and on to page 38, he, he talks about some of these things that go through the undulation, right? He says his interest in work. You know, at one point he might be really engaged in whatever his job is. And at another time, well, he's not, right? It's just what he has to do to live, right? Um, his affection for his friends. Sometimes, you know, there's a high point in that. And other times, well, we go through lulls in that too. His physical appetites, all of it, it says all of it goes up and down. Right? It's not just in one, one avenue of life. It's just in everything. Human beings go through ups and downs, right? It's... Just the reality of it. And so screw tape says that's what's happening to the patient with regard to his religious experience as well. So, the, but the question is why? Why do human beings go through that? Why, like, I, I, I think, you know, and I'm getting the sense from you guys too, that it, that it is kind of the, the recognizable fact of life that there's ups and downs in life, right? But the question is why? Why is it like that? So, screw tape offers perhaps we could call it part of the answer here okay and this is this bit where he says that humans are like humans are amphibians right that that they're these that humans are two-natured creatures not that they're frogs but they have the, this dual nature about them and this dual nature about them is the physical that we have bodies and the spiritual that we have souls right i was talking it's funny how sometimes these things just line up just on Monday, we had confirmation class here, and this is what we were talking about. We talked about the first article of the Apostles' Creed, the, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, right? And the first part of that, what we talk about is, well, God is the creator of heaven and earth. And that doesn't just mean, it, of course, means God made everything, but it specifically means that God made me. And when we look into the Bible at what it means that God made me, it's, that God made me uh, as a human being 
is something that's different and unique from anything else in all creation. Nowadays, there's a bit of a different line of thinking that says that human beings are just another among the many kinds of animals that exist on the earth, right? And there's animals and human beings and they're basically the same thing. But that's not what the Bible tells us. Not even close, right? When the, when the Bible tells us about God making animals, it says he made animals. And when it tells us about God making people, it says God made people. He made animals, all kinds of the beasts of the field, everything like that. And then he made people. And first of all, he made the people in his image, right? In the image of God, he made them. That makes them distinct from the animals, which are not created in the image of God. But the other thing that makes human beings distinct from the animals is shown to us in Genesis chapter two. And that's what's on the screen here. Genesis chapter two goes back and revisits the creation of man and gives you a little more detail. And one of the things it says here, it says, then the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground. So we got a picture like God, like this is later in the Bible, the image comes up of a potter and his clay, right? And he's formed us like a potter forms clay. Well, here it is, right? God, the potter is forming human beings out of the clay, out of the dirt of the ground. Right? And so he, he forms them and puts them together, but they're not alive yet. So here, here's, here's a human being, a human body, but it's not alive yet until it says, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became, it says here in this translation of the Bible, a living creature, which isn't a very good translation. What it should say essentially is a living soul, mm -hmm. right? So this is, so the difference between human beings and animals, animals are just created, human beings are created in the image of God. But this is the other difference. Human beings are created with bodies and with souls, which animals don't have, the souls. Right? God has to breathe into you, right? Yeah, breathe into them. And that's what makes them alive and distinct and unique. The other place you see this is in Ezekiel chapter 37. That's, the, uh, that, that, uh, that's the, the part of the Bible where you get the, 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 the vision of the, 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 the valley of the dry bones, right? Ezekiel's out there and he sees this vision of the valley of dry bones and there's just bones everywhere. And God says to Ezekiel, well, son of man, can these bones live? And he says, I don't know, you know, you tell me, right? And so God says, okay, Ezekiel prophesy to these bones that they come together and that skin be put back on them, flesh. And so he prophesies to the bones and they all click back together, right? And he says, there's a great rattling noise. And then he, then he prophesies that skin and flesh would grow on them and it does, right? And then you have a bunch of bodies standing there, but they're not alive until God says to Ezekiel, he says, okay, son of man, prophesy to the breath. And he prophesies to the breath and breath fills them and now they're alive an exceedingly great army is human beings are bodies and souls these two things together when it says god breathed into him i was going to bring out my the, the whiteboard and i forgot when it says god breathed into them we need to realize that the the bible word that talks about breathing is about more than the the oxygen and carbon dioxide going in and out of our mouth right the bible word both in the Old Testament, so in Hebrew, and in the New Testament, so in Greek, the Bible word means breath and spirit at the same time. They're not two separate words. They go together. So when it says he breathed into him the breath of life, it could just as easily say he spirited into him the spirit of life, like a soul. Okay, that's what's happening here. Therefore, human beings are different than animals. That's the, you know, the long, the short question I'm trying to answer with a very long answer. Right? The funny thing is people don't see it that way necessarily anymore, which is what I was saying before. Um, someone, someone at Redeemer told a story yesterday, um, and I don't know where he got this from, but uh, some survey that somebody did of some college student somewhere. Okay, so like I'm not being very precise about anything here. So don't quote me on this or anything. But this survey that somebody did of college students somewhere, at, you know, asked um, if, if you came to, you know, Lake Ontario, let's say, and you saw a, a dog and a human being drowning in the water, which one would you save first? 
And I guess like, according to this survey, and like I said, this is not at all scientific and I'm not vouching for this at all, but according to this survey, anyway, 60% of them said they'd save the dog first. You know, because they love the dog. They're not sure that they love the person, right? This human beings, we are messed up in our thinking, right? We, 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 we confuse all of these things. Uh, anyways, but there is a difference between human beings and animals. Human being, the value of a human life is intrinsically more than that of an animal. It's just, and I, I have a dog and I love my dog, but it's just the way it is, right? Human life is different. There's a segment of society that would actually are hoping that human beings will go extinct because it would be better yep. for the, the world and the creatures of it. Yeah. So it's not even that we're on par anymore scientifically, but there's a segment of society that actually puts us lower. Yeah, we're morally yeah. corrupt, and so we should all die so the animals can live. Yeah, there, there's people out there who think like this. Yeah. I think the reason why, and I think it's quite disgusting, the resurrection of the dead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's first of all, it's just a vision. It's not a literal thing that happened, right? It speaks of, you know, in Ezekiel's day is like, so it has, it has a literal and a, and a figurative interpretation, okay? So it, it, the Israel of Ezekiel's day was like a valley of dry bones cut off living in exile. God's promising to bring them, to restore them and give them life, right? And saying he can do that, okay? Right? But then it's also pointing us forward to the resurrection of the body on the last day, when exactly what happened in Ezekiel chapter 37 is going to happen in an even greater scale. Okay, so this, this is kind of to make the Old Testament clear things won't be allowed in Yeah, that too. Yeah. Yeah. But that but that's just foreshadowing the ultimate resurrection. Those saints died again and right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what screw tape says here is that human beings go through this undulation thing, these ups and downs, because they're, they're amphibians, their bodies and souls together, right? And, it's, and he says it's their physical side, their bodies, that cause them to go through ups and downs. That's what screw tape says. He says they're not just eternal spirits like we are. Screw tape and wormwood and the demons and all that, they're, they're just spirits. They don't have bodies, just like angels. Just spirits don't have bodies. Animals, on the other hand, are just bodies that don't have spirits, right? We're the weird hybrid in the middle, okay? And so screw tape tells Wormwood, human beings go through these ups and downs because they're these hybrids, because their physical side causes them to go through that. And I, and I, I guess there's some level of truth to that. And taking a step back here again from the, the story itself to C.S. Lewis, the writer of the book, I think he probably gets it a little bit wrong here in that there's more to it than just human beings go through ups and downs because we're physical creatures. God made us to be physical creatures in the very beginning, looked at us as physical creatures and said, it's very good, right? There was, when, when, when God made Adam and Eve and created the world and said it was very good, there was no undulation. There were no ups and downs in life. There was just very good all the time. So it's not just because we're physical creatures that we go through ups and downs, okay? Before I tell you, what's the reason we go through ups and downs? I think because if we have the downs make us appreciate the ups more. Yeah. Yeah, so we can see the reason why God lets this happen, but Tracy hit the, hit the reason. It's the fall into sin, right? That's the reason there's ups and downs in life. Um, so human beings are physical creatures, and physicality isn't bad. This is, the, like, this is an important thing to remember. Being a physical being is not a bad thing. Right? God made us to be that way. But our physical nature is corrupted by this thing called the fall into sin, which rather than give you the whole story, like all of the Bible words there, I just put the picture on the screen. There's um, Adam and Eve and, uh, and the snake up there, and they're grabbing an apple, and all heck is about to break loose. Um, and, and that's the reason. That's the reason there's ups and downs, right? That's the reason why we're not always up here. Now, to Linda's point, this is what, what we're gonna deal with the rest of today is, well, why does God let this happen, right? Why doesn't God, God could 
stop that and take all of that away right now. And someday he's going to do that. Jesus is going to come again, raise our bodies from the dead and the, the undulation, the ups and downs, they'll stop. But for now, God is letting that happen. So why? Why is God letting that happen? And, that's, and, and, and Linda, you're on the right track um, with, with what you said about that. So we'll, 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 we'll spend the rest of the time today talking about why. Why does God let that happen? And there's a lot of different answers to that, um, that the book gives us and that the Bible gives us especially. So, the, 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 so we've established here this point that human beings go through this, uh, these undulations, these ups and downs, and in the book here they call it the peaks and the troughs. So we're going to keep using that word, the troughs. Okay? I, it bothers me because when I think of a trough, I think of what you feed a pig in or something like that, a, a food trough, right? But C.S. Lewis is British and they use words slightly differently. And for him, a trough is more like what we would call a valley, right? We would call, we would say peaks and valleys. He says peaks and troughs. So we'll stick with his word and use troughs, but think this, we're not talking about a food trough. Let's remember that, okay? And, this, and, the, and the thing is, and this is what screw tape What screw tape even thinks is going to be surprising for Wormwood and probably surprising for us, although I think we also know it to be true at the same time, is that Jesus uses the troughs, the low points, more than he uses the peaks to accomplish his purposes. Okay? This is what, so this is what, back to the book again, page 38, this is what screw tape says. He says, now it may surprise you to learn that in his efforts to get permanent possession of a soul, the enemy, Jesus, relies on the troughs even more than on the peaks. Some of his special favorites have gone through longer and deeper troughs than anyone else. So, this, so the screw tape says this may surprise us, but Jesus actually uses the troughs more than the peaks to accomplish his purposes. And he says that some of, some of Jesus' special favorites, now by that we don't mean like Jesus loves some people more than others. No, that's not what we're saying, right? But he's, he's referring to some of those significant people from the Bible. Some of those saints from the Bible went through longer and deeper troughs than anyone else. So let's Let's, let's think about that for a second. Can we think of examples of people from the Bible who went through longer or deeper troughs than the ordinary person? Job, Job like the case in point, Job, right? He's, he is one of God's quote unquote favorites, right? To the point that when Satan comes into heaven, remember we read this just a couple of weeks ago, when Satan comes into heaven, you know, God asks him, what have you been doing? He says, what have you been doing? And then God says, have you considered my servant Job, right? And so he's one of God's favorites, and yet God allows him to go through that really terrible suffering. I, we don't know how long Job's suffering went on, so we don't know how long the trough was, but it was awfully deep. It was a deep one, right? He lost everything that belonged to him. He lost all of his children, and then he lost his own health, and basically his wife, too, because she said, why don't you just curse God and die? And then his friends, you know, berated him for heaven knows how long, right? It got, so it was incredibly low or deep, that trough, okay? But what was the purpose? What was God doing there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, he, yeah, so he's testing. He's testing Job's faith. And, and Job does stumble towards the end. Job turns a corner and starts, and starts speaking against what God is saying, or speaking against God. But then God swoops in to confront Job about that and to restore him, right? God's purpose in letting Job go through that is to test his faith and to strengthen his faith. And in the end of the book, that's, what, that's what happens. You have Job, who's there to tell his friends that they have to repent, and he's there to forgive them on behalf of God for everything, for everything that they said to him. So Kathy wrote here in the box, is when we are weak in the trough, other words, in other words, 
He is strong. God wants us to rely on him always. Definitely. We'll, we'll see that here uh, a little more in just a second. So what are other Bible examples of individuals, people in the trough? So we got Job. Jeremiah. Jeremiah is another good one. Okay. Jeremiah is a prophet in the Old Testament who prophesies to the people of Israel and warns them that things could get real bad for them if they don't turn back to God right now. The people hate what Jeremiah says, so they beat him up. They lock him in the, in the what do they call those things? Um, what is, what's that called? Where you're, 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 what's that? Yeah, like that. Yeah, like where your head's in the block, in the blocks, right? And your arms and you're stuck there. They lock him there all the time. They throw him in a waterless pit, right? They do all kinds of terrible things to him, so much so that Jeremiah says, to God, like, God, I wish that I could keep your words inside my heart and not speak them anymore. Because every time I speak them, people do awful things to me. And then he says, but your word is like a fire inside my heart. I can't keep it in. And so I have to speak it. And every time he does, he gets beaten up and awful things done to him, right? Jeremiah's life, they call, they, we sometimes call Jeremiah the weeping prophet, right? His life is a trough. <laughs> It's deep and it's long. <laughs> but God's working through Jeremiah, right? Not, not just to, to shape Jeremiah's faith, although there is that too, but to set Jeremiah as an example for other people of patiently enduring suffering, of being faithful to God's word. So God doesn't just use the troughs to, to shape and form our lives, but also the lives of people around us. That's the example we see from Jeremiah. Any other, what are, what are some other examples? Look, any, can we think of any other ones? Daniel, yeah. Daniel, Daniel, along with all of the people of Israel, are in a long trough, right? Because they're, they're taken from Israel and taken to Babylon to live there as slaves for 70 years. So that's a long trough, okay? But then Daniel specifically ends up in, it's a particularly short trough of overnight in a lion's den, right? But that's a trough too, right? Now the long trough there, the, the, the 70 years in Israel, that's a, a punishment for their sin, right? Not specifically Daniel, but the whole nation of Israel, right? God has sent them to Babylon because they've abandoned God, okay? So that trough is in one sense a punishment for their sin. Also God working to turn them back, God's just not just punishing them because he's mad and just chucks something down at them from heaven to, you know, I hope you suffer, you know? No, he sends a bad thing so that it turns them around. So the purpose of that big trough is to bring them to repentance, okay? Then, then you have the little trough of Daniel in the lion's den, which isn't so much for Daniel's own benefit because Daniel goes to that trough. No, he, Daniel doesn't pray to the king which is why he gets thrown in the trough. So Daniel knows exactly what he's doing when he gets thrown in the lion's den. He's more there to be an example to the king who doesn't want to put Daniel down there, but has to because he made the law. And then the next day sees that Daniel has been preserved. So just like Jeremiah, this is an example of God putting a human being through the troughs into a, into a low place to be an example to the people around him. And as they faithfully endure it, with the help of God strengthening them, like God is in, like God sends the angels to shut the mouths of the lions. So it's not like Daniel's in there fighting lions or something like that. He's just sitting in the corner, right? God's the one keeping the lion's mouth shut. So that Daniel, at the end of the, the end of the night, when the king comes back, is an example to the king of faithfully enduring this suffering, which God has sent his way, and which God is protecting him from. So yeah, Daniel's a great example. Other? The apostles, all of them. All of the apostles, yeah. Uh, we'll get to, uh, the, the, the easiest one to look at is Paul specifically, right? The apostle Paul, God puts him in a short trough, but it's kind of deep, right? Because Saul is on his way to Damascus to go arrest the Christians, right? And then Jesus stops him on the road, says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he strikes him blind. And then Saul is blind for three days. Well, that's a three-day trough right there. Low point. Not just because he's blind, but, but because while he's blind and unable to see, 
he's wrestling in his own heart with the fact that he's been killing Christians now for heaven knows how long. And the guy those Christians worship just showed up on the road and told him he was persecuting him. Right? It's not like Saul sat there blind for three days saying, ho oh, hum, I sure hope this goes away soon. No, he's in a spiritual crisis trying to wrap his head around what this all means because he's done something real bad. He's persecuting God, right? He goes through that trough to bring him to repentance. That's what that's another example of. So that th after three days, he gets baptized. He's a Christian now, and he's going out to preach the good news about Jesus. Then the rest of his life is full of troughs, multiple times where Paul is locked up in prison, all these kind of things. And we'll read an example of that a little bit later on, where Paul says that that happened to cause them to trust in Jesus throughout the, not just in the peaks, but in, in the troughs, like Kathy was saying too, when we are weak, then he is strong. And it, and it also reflects to others about who Jesus is, because how many of those apostles were put to death for what they believed, yeah. and yet the church grew substantially in that time. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and so he's also an example to others. Yeah, I'm trying to not make them all examples to others, right? Because <laughs> we've had a lot of those, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm not going to start on Martin Luther because when I start on Martin Luther, then I just get going, right? So I'm, <laughs> I could go on for a while and a while like that, but it's definitely true. Martin Luther counts as one of those examples too. Um, any other, especially biblical ones? Esther. Esther goes through that. She's yeah in the trough. Yeah. Too bad she's not here. We could talk about <laughs> Esther. Uh, <laughs> The other one, and I'm just, some of the ones we thought of yesterday at Redeemer, Moses. Yeah, yeah Moses is in the will, and, and the rest of the people of Israel for 40 yeah. years, That's right? Happened. That's a long trough, yeah. right? That's a long haul. That one's because of their sin, right? They won't have to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because they don't trust God. So it's to teach them to trust God, the people of Israel. Uh, but it's all, so, so that's the purpose of that one. And there's a couple other examples with Moses' life too, but... You know, but we don't need to get into all those necessarily. John the Baptist's trap even has in question whether Jesus was even legit. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he yeah. gets one of his followers to go to Jesus and say, are you actually the one? Yeah, or are you the one to come or should we look for somebody else? Yeah, John the Baptist lives in the trough that ends with his head being cut off. That's the, that's the end of that story for him, right? But, not, but at the same time, it's not the end of the story, right? That's why John can willingly accept what's happened to him. Because he believes in the resurrection of the dead. Oh, that reminds me of another one. Abraham. Oh, and Esther's not here. <laughs> Abraham gets this promise from God that he will give, that God will give him a son, and then lives for the next 25 years in the trough of not having that prayer answered. And then the, then this, the reason I love this one is because of the why. Well, why, why in the world does God do that to Abraham? to teach Abraham to trust God. So that after that child is born, when God says to Abraham, go take that son that I promised to give you and finally gave to you 25 years later and take him up on a mountain and kill him, that Abraham's ready to do it because he trusts God. And he walks up to that mountain. This is my favorite part of the story. He walks up to that mountain and he's got his servants with him. And he says to the servants, stay here. I and the boy are gonna go up the mountain and make a sacrifice, and we will come back to you. He, he doesn't, he, he's convinced he's going to have to go up there and kill Isaac. But he's also convinced that if he has to kill Isaac, God is going to raise him from the dead. And so Isaac's going to come back down the mountain too. So God makes him wait 25 years to have that kid, so that when that moment comes, Abraham is ready to, to trust God. And so he does, goes up the mountain and God provides before he has to kill his son. But anyways, yeah. And like we're, just, like we're just skimming the surface here of all the people in the Bible who go through troughs. Like we left out the big one, but we'll get to the big one at the end, right? Jesus, right? <laughs> but we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. So there's all kinds of examples of people going through troughs and, and all kinds of different reasons in the Bible for it. Summing it all of that up, Summing all of that up, we can look at the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, 
Hebrews chapter 11 is this beautiful, is one of the most beautiful chapters of the whole Bible. It goes through, uh, the, the, words were, the words are here on the screen, but if you want to look it up in the Bible, you can. Hebrews chapter 11 goes through the Old Testament. And all of these people that we've been talking about, um, no, we, didn't, we didn't mention Noah, but okay, Noah and Abraham and Moses and da, 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 on through the line. And it keeps saying, by faith. These people did these things by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. That's how all of these people live. And then, and then it gets to a point and it says, well, they, 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 if we went on forever like this, the book would never end. So it says, well, and that's not to say anything about, you know, Daniel and da, 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 all these other guys. And then it sums it all up here close to the end of the chapter. And it says, this is what happened to these people. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. I don't know who that's specifically referring to, but it's saying awful things happened to them, right? They were killed with a sword. They went about in the skins of sheep and goats. That sounds a bit like John the Baptist wearing camel hair out in the wilderness, right? Uh, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts. Again, that sounds like John the Baptist and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. It says that's what these people who have gone before us, that's what they were like. And they endured all of these things by faith, trusting in God's promises. And then skipping over into chapter 12, and this is where you know, this fits with just this past Sunday, we had All Saints Day, right? And then it says, therefore, since we, you and me, are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and that's kind of what you see here in this picture here, right? You have all these people gathered around, right? And I, I just noticed this yesterday during Bible study at Redeemer. Let's see if I can draw this on here. Look at this guy. You see him down there? Right down in the bottom right-hand corner. So you have all these people up in heaven, and there's one poor soul standing there <laughs> down on earth. But it illustrates the picture, Right? That one guy is surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, of people from the Old Testament who faithfully endured whatever suffering came their way, trusting in God uh, and in his promises of salvation for them through Jesus. And so we're surrounded by this great cloud of people, biblical people and people more closely connected to us in time or family connections or friends or whatever, who have patiently endured this suffering, have gone through the troughs, just like we are. And how did they do it? Hebrews chapter 12 says, therefore, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Look at what they're doing. Their eyes are all fixed on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Right? So we have this example of all these people who have gone through the troughs before us, and it's saying, look at them. They endured. They made it through because of their faith in Jesus. We can do the same. Let's trust Jesus like they did. That's what Hebrews chapter 12 is saying. Fix our eyes on Jesus. But the question still lingers there. Why? So why, but why do we have to go through all of this? Why does, it, why does there have to be ups and downs? Well, we talked about that already. The ups and downs are because of sin. But why does God insist on using the down times, the troughs, the low points? Because we'd rather he not, if we're completely honest, right? We'd much rather God spend more time using the good times. That would be much more comfortable, right? But we've got to see why, okay? And screw tape is going to give us a reason, and then the Bible is going to give us a bunch of reasons, Okay? Screw tape says the reason is this. To us, to the demons, a human is primarily food. Our aim is the absorption of its will into ours, the increase of our own area of selfhood at, his, at its expense. Basically, what screw tape says for us, the demons, human beings are food. But the obedience which the enemy, which Jesus demands, is quite a different thing. One must face the fact that all the talk about his love for men and his service being perfect freedom is not, as one would gladly believe, mere propaganda, stuff that people just say, but actually an appalling truth, appalling from the perspective of the demons, okay? He, Jesus, really does 
want to fill the universe with a lot of loathsome little replicas of himself. So what screw tape is saying is, I think I've got one more. Let's read a little bit further. We want cattle who can finally become food. He wants servants who can finally become sons or daughters, right? That's, so, that's the one I take it for a bucket. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the idea here is screw tape is saying, we, the demons, we, we can just give them whatever they want, right? Because we think of them as, as cattle, right? We just want to keep them fed and happy until such a time as we're ready to slaughter and eat them. Jesus doesn't think of us like cattle, right? He's not just going to give us whatever we want to keep us happy until the day he's ready to eat us. He doesn't want to eat us, right? He wants us to be servants who will become children sons or daughters. And that requires him to let us go through troughs. You don't need to let the cow go through a trough, right? You just let the cow be happy and healthy as long as it's got to live, and then you eat it when the day comes to eat it, right? But you, and I, maybe I have one more here, but, but you let your kids go through troughs. Right? You let your children go through low points. You have to. And he's going to, uh, uh, there's another quote from the book here that's going to talk like that, but that's maybe at the end. So the, the, the end, the goal that Jesus is trying to produce requires that he take a different approach. He's not creating cattle. He's creating children. So he has to let them go through these troughs so that they become his children, they become his people. And that through the troughs, they're shaped and they're formed as his people. There's a, there's a, there's a, a reason behind all of it. And as a parent, how hard it is. Yeah, it is hard for a parent, to, for us to let that happen. And you can imagine how much more God, like if our heart aches to watch our children go through troughs and difficult times, how much more does God's heart ache to see us, his children, going through our own suffering, and yet he knows we have to do it, right? And he lets us go, right? Just like Jesus says about prayer, you know, if, you're, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to you, right? Well, if we who are evil know how to feel bad for our children when they go through a tough time, how much more does God our father in heaven, who isn't evil, know how to care for us when we go through the troughs? The low points, right? So the Bible, so so screw tape says the reason Jesus uses the troughs, the low points, is because that's what necess is necessary to actually shape and form us as servants and sons rather than cattle, right? And the Bible basically tells us the same thing a whole bunch of times over and over. Okay. So this is just a small smattering. If you want if, there are a billion and one, not, not a billion, but there's a whole bunch of Bible verses that tell you about why suffering exists, why we go through suffering and the strength that we have for suffering and all these kind of things. But just a few verses about it here. So James chapter one, count it all as joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your face, faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Right? So I think of Job here, right? The testing of your faith. That's what's happening to Job. Job's faith is being test tested so that it produces steadfastness, something that's immovable, doesn't change, right? And that's the result with Job. He goes through this test. He holds strong for a little while, and then he fails, and he starts blaming God for all of this. But then God comes and restores him, and you have steadfast Job, who's been made steadfast through this trial, this test that he's gone through. Uh, so, so th th there's that. Then in Romans chapter 1, or chapter 5, starting with verse 1, um, we have another example. So Paul writes, therefore, 
Since we have been justified by faith, we've been made right with God through faith in Jesus. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. We have peace with God. It's not like there's a fight going on between me and God. There's not. We've got peace with, between me and God through Jesus. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Because we're justified by faith, we have peace with God, we rejoice in the hope that he gives us, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Not only that, though, Paul says, but we rejoice in our sufferings. I remember when we talked about this last year, when we went through Romans, we stop right here and we say, really? Do we? rejoice in our sufferings but paul says yes we can and we do we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance not worldly endurance like you'll get through this but faith that endures suffering strengthens our faith so that it can endure and endurance produces character not worldly character like you know i'm a better person because of what i've gone through but christian character shapes and forms us to be like jesus okay and character produces hope not hope that oh this will all get better someday but hope that god's gonna save me from all of this suffering that i'm experiencing right now maybe in this life but especially in the life to come and hope doesn't put us to shame because god's love has been poured into our hearts through the holy spirit who has been given to us right and another one, this is, my, this is my favorite. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So when we were talking about Paul before, and Paul getting, and the other apostles getting locked up and put in prison, this is just great. Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. And that's just one of the areas that Paul went to. For we were so utterly burdened, beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself it was a bad trough indeed we felt that we had received the sentence of death but that was to make us not rely make us rely not on ourselves but on god who raises the dead this bible verse blows out of the water that old saying that people throw around that god never gives you more than you can handle he does. He gave Paul way more than he could handle. He said, we felt like we had been sentenced to death. But God doesn't give you more than he can handle. Which is what he's showing Paul here. Paul says it feels like we had received a sentence of death, but this happened to teach us to trust the one who raises the dead. So the troughs teach us to trust in Jesus, the one who raises the dead. And then Hebrews chapter 12, we talked about Hebrews chapter 12 just a minute ago, but this is another really good one. It says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. We have to understand discipline the right way. We've got English, the words just change over time. So now when we think of discipline, we think of somebody does something bad, a child does something bad, therefore we discipline them. And there's a punishment for the bad thing that they did. But See if I can write this here. I don't even, I'm going to use the touchpad here to try and do this. Uh, I'm not going to be able to write like this. Yeah. Anyways, well, I'm not going to try. If you look at, if you look at the word discipline and you take off the I N E off of the end and put an E there instead, it says disciple. Right which just means a, a learner, a student. Discipline doesn't that just mean punishment. Discipline means teaching for learning, right? One of the ways we teach our children is by punishing them, granted, but that is not the only way we teach, right? So when it says it is for discipline, you have to endure. It's not just talking about punishment because you did something bad. It's talking about, we could essentially say, it is for teaching and learning that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline, teach? If you are left without discipline, without teaching, which is sometimes painful and difficult, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children. You're not really his children if he's not bothering to teach you and not sons. 
Besides this, we all ha we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, taught us, maybe pun probably punished us too, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For, and live? for they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. So those troughs are discipline, not just punishment for something wrong that we've done, although sometimes they are that too. But through them, God is teaching us, right? Disciplining us for our good so that we may share in his holiness, so that he can shape and form us into his people and give us his holiness, the holiness of Jesus. All right, think of God. Oh, yeah, one more, one more, couple more quotes from the book, and then one more Bible verse, or two more Bible verses, and then we're done. So Screwtape, on page 40, Screwtape says, we can drag our patience along by continual tempting because we only design them for the table. He says, we just want to eat them. So we can drag them along however, by whatever means necessary to get them to where we want them to be because we're just going to eat them in the end anyways. It doesn't matter. He, however, the enemy, Jesus, wants them to learn to walk and must, therefore, take away his hand. So that's where the, 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 the parent-child thing comes back in. You got to imagine like a toddler learning to walk, right? This isn't easy. I remember when we were first parents and the first when Hannah was learning to walk, right? That was hard to let her go and let her do that, right? But as the on our third and coming soon fourth one now, you just say, oh, whatever. They fall, they get up and whatever. It's okay. They survive. Right? They survive. It's amazing what they live through. You know, but it's, the tr it's, a, it's a truth of parenting that if you want your children to learn how to walk, you're going to have to let them do it. You're going to have to let them stumble. You're going to have to let them fall. And screw tape is saying that essentially that's why God lets his people go through the troughs because he wants them to learn how to walk. And when he said, and I, I should have put this Bible verse in, but I forgot. Um, it's Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, nine, and 10. And it talks about this walking. So Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, it's where it says, uh, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's like big time Lutheran Bible verse, right? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith this is not your own doing. It's apart from works of the law so that nobody can boast. Okay? And Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You're saved by grace through faith. And then in verse 10, it says, For we are his, God's, workmanship. Something that he has made in creation, but also something he's making new right now. Okay? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do so that we might walk in them. He's, he wants us to walk, not just to, not just to walk, right? We know how to walk most of the time, right? He wants us to walk in good works. And in order for us to learn how to do that, he has to sometimes let go so that we learn to walk. Now, we sit there and think, God's gone, he's abandoned me. Well, no, he's actually right there, just like the parent who's letting their two-year-old walk on their own, right? Not even two, but whatever age they are, right? Learning to walk on their own. They're not, it's not like they left the house and they'll be back next week. They, they may just be around the corner, but they're right there. And as soon as the kid falls on its head, they're going to be swooping in like nobody's business, right? But they let him walk. And so God lets us walk so that we would learn to walk in those good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do. And then, then this, is, this next part from the book here is just beautiful too. He says, do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring, wanting, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks around, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. So this is, That's another one there for the little... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he says, he says, for screw tape says, this is like the worst thing that can happen. That a human being looks around the world 
and feels as if God has forsaken them, which, by the way, he hasn't. Okay, we can be absolutely assured of that. Feels as if God has forsaken them and yet still tries to do what God wants him to do, obeys. And the picture of that is Jesus, right? So why does God let us go through the troughs? So that we might be like Jesus. Because when Jesus was on the cross at about the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, he cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He looked around at a world that in which God had actually forsaken him, not because of anything that he had done, but because of your sin and mine. And rather than seeing God having forsaken him, abandoning the mission that God sent him to do, he obeyed. Right? He's the son of God. Just like the crowds around him said, if he wanted to bring himself down from the cross, he could. And so in that moment, dejected because God had forsaken him, that's exactly what he could have done. But he doesn't. For you and for me, he stays there on the cross and completes his father's will. And that screw tape says is the absolute worst thing that could ever happen. That one of these little other little human beings starts to do what Jesus did. Which is faithfully obey the father even when he seems to have completely taken his hand away. Because here's the thing. He does take his hand away but unlike Jesus on the cross he hasn't ever, com won't ever completely forsake us. It's like the one hymn that we sometimes sing during communion. What is this bread? Right? One of the, the lines says why have you not forsaken me oh taste and see the lord i think at the end of the line is the lord is free but the point is you know we recognize that we ought to be forsaken by god he doesn't forsake us he forsake jesus so that we would never be forsaken and so but we look around at the world sometimes and it seems as if we have been forsaken and screw tape says the worst thing that can happen then is for that for us to nonetheless keep on obeying the voice of our heavenly father and that's what paul in Philippians chapter 3, I think, is praying what happened to him. So he says that he counts all things as loss, he says here in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him, know Jesus, and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Faithfully trusting God in his death that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. So why does God use, or why does Jesus use the troughs? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Why does he use the low points in our lives? You know, to teach us, to, to shape and form us, to do all these things, but ultimately to make us like himself. Because he actually does want a whole bunch of little copies of himself running around the world, loving their neighbor as their self, imperfectly, failing at it, but trusting in him for the forgiveness of sins and looking forward to that resurrection of the dead. Because just like he is risen from the dead, we too shall rise. And the sufferings of this present age are not worth comparing to the eternal weight of glory that he has prepared for those who trust in him. Thoughts, questions about any of that? I've been ranting on for like 45 minutes now. Yeah, union with Jesus, being one with Jesus, and that he, but that, but but that's how, but that, but that that has already started here and now as he works in us to shape and form that. It's never going to be complete as long as we're here, but he doesn't just say, "Hang on, someday I'll give you this thing. You'll be like me." He says, "No, I'm going to start it now." Right, and for as we look at it, the process isn't necessarily always enjoyable, but when we know what it is. When we know what's happening, that's a blessed thing. And we can recognize it for what it is. Yeah. And that person has to trust him again. There's no other way to do it. Jesus has to trust him. There you go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, on account of our sinful nature, um, as physical and spiritual beings, uh, who have rebelled against you and gone our own way. Uh, we go through ups and downs in life. Uh, this is our own doing, uh, but we also know that you use these things, especially the low times, the troughs, the, the valleys, the difficult times. You use them 
to teach us and guide us and to instruct us and especially to shape us as your children. Help us to endure these difficult times, looking to all those examples from the Bible of people who have gone before us, trusting in you, but most of all, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at your right hand on high. Help us to trust in him, to cling to him, and cause us to be shaped and formed to be like him, to be your people in this world, walking in the good works you've prepared for us to do. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.